army, something that you need to be interested in, how much can you write about God? And yet, why are you in the world? And if I'm in the world, if I'm in the world to know God, how is it that I do not know much about God? And now that I'm in the world and God made me to know Him, how much do I love Him? That's the whole purpose of life. It's not for any other reason except that I might love Him. If He put me in this world, why should I love Him? Because I am a child of God. He did not teach me to pray, our judge, our creator, our savior. I was to pray, our Father. Uh, this is what I am to call God. It is the Father in heaven who has given me my existence. Surely, Father, that I know him. And that I love him, and since I want to love him more, that I serve him. How do you serve God? You serve him. What does that mean? You let him teach you. You let him bring you up. You let him have his way with your life. Why? Because the world is a tangle, it's a thicket, and it's very easy to get lost. And unless I hold on to God's hand, which is His will, unless I hold on to the will of God, I'll be lost. And to not be discovered is to die in the tangle or the thicket, to die spiritually. And when one is dead, one is buried. And if you die spiritually and never recover, never make your peace with God, never obtain His mercy in God, you will be buried in the tomb of hell. And to see to it that that happens, there are demons who roam the face of the world seeking the damnation of souls. You said that tonight at the end of Mass in the prayer, St. Michael the Archangel. Then this is battle, the battle of life. What's the battle about? Is the battle against my own selfishness. I want my way, even before God's. Is the battle against the flesh? Is the battle against the world? Is the battle against the devil? And the devil uses me, my selfishness, and uses the world against me, spirit, utterly against God's spirit, and uses. His own powers. And what are his powers? Well, they're so mighty I can't possibly resist him for even one beat of my heart. That's how powerful he is. And that's what's lined up against me. The spirit of the world? Go along. Don't be different. Do what others do. The spirit of the world comes from hell. And the temptations of the flesh? The young, year, young years of life, we call them sins of impurity. Those are the sins which once tasted, leave a capacity to return again and again and again for more sins of the same kind. And before you know it, in the shortest possible time, you are changed to habits of mortal sin. Now, mortal sin means that one has died spiritually. It means that if you are in an automobile accident, it means that if you were pushed down the stairs by someone who's just falling but smashed your skull, it means that if you die in a state of mortal sin, you are going to be buried in the tomb of hell. Because mortal sin is spiritual death, and mortal sin takes one away from God permanently. Until the end of the world, and for all eternity, one remains spiritually dead unless you return by the grace of God, you return to the sacraments. Now kids, you haven't got a chance, and the older people here know it's true, you haven't got a chance to save your soul without God. And the spirit of this present day 
is keep the kids from God. And if he already has them, take them away. Now the younger children don't know what I'm talking about, but I've passed over some subjects with them earlier really today. I'm talking to the older ones. The school system that exists in America, and there are individual schools that are not like this, and individual teachers that are not like this, but the school system as a system is calculated to damn you to hell. Because it teaches paganism, out and out. It teaches you to take care of yourself at the expense of anybody. It teaches you how to be selfish. And at the same time, it teaches you how to care for others. It splits you in half. The school system is a laboratory. And it breaks you down. Analysis. And then it puts you together again. Synthesis. For the new product that exists is not the original product. After it takes away your principles and takes away your character and takes away spirit of your home, and after it has destroyed your values, it gives you a new spirit and a new view of your home, and gives you new values and a new way to live. And you're wounded or dead spiritually, wounded terribly. And how do you find the wounds in the young people? How do you know them to be wounded so terribly? By their confusion by the fact that they don't know what to do with themselves or their life, and they're frightened by so much, dismayed by so much, and ignorant of so much. You have been told and told and told on television, in movies, in magazines, in newspapers, in class, in textbooks, and this is the best educated generation of children the world has ever known. It's a lie. You don't know how dumb you are. That might shock you, but that's the truth. Not you as a person, but you all the kids in the whole school. I mean everybody in the state of Illinois. I mean everybody in the United States of America. You don't know how dumb you are. Why? Because there are very few of you that know who made you and the answer. Why? There are ignorant people in South America, in Central America, and in Europe. They know the answer. And they can hardly write and they can hardly read. By the way, you don't read much. You don't write much. In comparison to boys and girls of 20 years ago, the way they could read and the way they could write. I know what I'm talking about now because I'm a teacher. Boys and girls go to college today, and they have remedial reading in the first year of college, and remedial math, and remedial English. Think of it. Who's telling you the lie about how smart you are, and what a wonderful education you are? The educational system has filled the schools of America with children who are spiritual ignoramuses, they hardly know about God, and they know next to nothing about themselves and the purpose of their life, and that is why so many of them use drugs. And that is why so many of them live a life of impurity. They're running away from themselves. They're running away from the world they live in. They're frightened by it, and some of them hate the world they live in. Where's your happiness? It's been taken from you. Who took it? The society that we call American, it's no longer American, but it's still called that. The America that used to be was Christian. The America that is today is completely pagan, frighteningly removed from God. And that's the world you live in. And you, because you're young, are impressionable. And the impressions that can be made upon you are the impressions that are going to last a lifetime. I told the little kids this evening that when the devil approaches them, he teaches them. 
He teaches them so well that they never forget the lessons. But he teaches them how to lie, last a lifetime. When he teaches them how to cheat or steal or be dishonest or how to be lazy, when he teaches them impurity, you learn once, you never need another lesson again. Now that's what you're up against. You are living in a world that is pagan. And there is so much pagan in the United, paganism in the United States of America that Satanism is here. Mothers and fathers tell me that they're so upset about their boys and girls in high school. They're so afraid of drugs, they tell me why father was even down in the grammar school. I don't have the heart to tell them, don't be worried about drugs. That's an epidemic already, but the new epidemic is coming. The new epidemic. Why, that's Satanism. Your boys and girls are actually going to worship him. We'll pray to him. That's what you have to worry about. Yeah, that's how far gone we are, kids. There are boys and girls in your own classroom right this evening who can tell you so much about Satanism because their mother or father or both are Satanists, and they are too. And they even go to a Satanic church or if they don't, are going to go when they can find one. And remember, you're young and impressionable. If you learn lessons of evil once, and they last a lifetime, who knows this? The devil knows this. And this is why he's after the young. You're the prize. God wants you. You're his child. But the kidnapper from hell wants you. But he doesn't want you to return you to God after a price has been paid. Once he lays his hand on you, he wants to kill you spiritually. He wants to tear you to tatters and keep you forever in hell. He wants to teach you mortal sin now. He wants to take away your faith now. And he wants you to despair now. He wants you to quit he wants you to say, Mother, I am so sick and tired of being different from other kids. I'm so sick and tired of what they say to me, the fun they make of me. I'm so sick and tired of blushing and being ashamed. That's the devil's vocabulary that you're learning. Those are his sentences. He's put that into your mind. You want to give in. You don't want to struggle anymore. He, the liar from hell, has taught you. Ah, you're different from everybody else. Do you know why you must be different from everybody else? Because God commanded you. He said, honor thy father and mother. I told the little ones tonight, he didn't say obey them. That's not enough. He said, honor thy father and mother. That means you obey them, that means you trust them, that means you talk to them and tell them your troubles and ask for help, and that means you reverence them. You respect their judgment. You know they will not harm you. You see how dumb you are? Ever, ever so many, I don't mean you as persons, I mean kids your age in school. See how dumb you are? Ever, ever so many of you young people will listen to anybody except your own mother and father. You listen to a school teacher, you listen to a principal, you listen to the gang down at the gasoline station, you listen to these commentators on television, you listen to whoever the movie actor is in the movie, you listen to whoever it is that wrote the article in the newspaper, all the bunk and baloney and lie and blasphemy and hell of it. You listen to them. These people don't give a hoot whether you live or die, but your mother and father would die in your place if you were to be executed tomorrow. They love you to the point of dying for you. And still, ever, ever, ever so many kids, they don't trust their parents. They don't tell them anything. They give them nothing but back talk, staffs, and irreverence. Not disrespect, it's worse than that. 
And who did the teach you? The devil. How did he teach? Through human beings. See how dumb the kids are today? They'll listen to degenerates. They'll listen to communists. They'll listen to people who hate God. They'll listen to anybody except their own mother and father. See how dumb the kids are today? It isn't a case of they can't read well. It isn't a case of they don't know much about their country, much about God. It isn't a case of they don't know much about history or much about geography or much about grammar. It isn't a case of that. They're just so dumb that they will trust demons before they'll trust the guardian angel. That's how dumb they are. And they will trust the devil before they trust God. That's how dumb they are. And they will trust human beings who themselves are like fiends because of their own personal immorality. They'll listen to them. Who are they? Movie actors. Who are they? People on television. Who are they? Sport heroes. Who are they? The bum down the street. There was a day when a man or a woman would be called a, a drunk, a bum, a tramp, a degenerate, a pervert. And today, what do they call The heroes. Those are the people that get all the attention. There was a time when people were put in prison for the way that they lived. And that's how these people lived. And who are they? Why, those are the teachers in the classroom. Those are the famous reporters in Chicago. Those are the people who have their names and rights. Those are the people you read about or hear about. There was a time when they were arrested and put away because they were a menace to society. And what are they now today? They're the heroes for the kids. I could name them now, but I won't. But you would recognize all the names. And you say, oh yeah, oh yeah, what? I recognize the name, I recognize the name. Why do you recognize them? Because I'm forever hearing about them. Why do you hear about them? I'll tell you why you hear about them. Because evil women and men who make a fortune in the music industry, the record business, who make a fortune in television and who make a fortune in education, who make a fortune in the movies, who make a fortune in printing books, they know that these people are rotten to the core. And they want them be the kind of people that you know, that you listen to. Because these very evil people know just what they're doing. They want the damnation of kids and they want their dollars. But they know what they're doing when they put filthy pictures before your eyes and put filth in your mind and teach you lies and say it's truth and turn things upside down and backward and front and inside out. They know what they're doing. And you're young and you're impressionable and you take the lessons and you don't forget them. You learn well. Why? Because God gave you a mind to know Him and a will and a heart to love Him and a life to be used to serve Him. But you can pervert it. And because you're young and you don't know that much, old people or older people can take advantage of you and use you and destroy you and send you to hell. And because they themselves are so profoundly evil, they find it a task that is not too burdensome. And so they will work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, thinking of new ways to make more money than the teenagers. And what do the teenagers do? They gobble up everything that comes out. Are you supposed to shave your skull this year? The girls will all shave their skulls if that's the style this year. Are you supposed to have your three front teeth pulled out and not replaced? Then the boys will have their three front teeth pulled out. I'm exaggerating, but you know it's the food. Who sets the fashion? Very evil people. Who wears the fashion? Very good girls and boys. Who after a while become very bad girls and very bad boys. Why? 
they are in their dumbness, unaware that there is a tire that's immodest. But once you get accustomed to immodesty so that you do not know that you are immodest, you have taken away the edge from the spirituality of your soul and of your life, and you are becoming callous, callous, hardened, toughened to grace. Grace does not so easily penetrate into your soul. And when you have begun to live immodestly in the way you dress, and the day comes that for you it's not immodesty, and you will defend it with indignation against your mother and father, then you are ready then for impurity because modesty is the shield that protects you from temptations against purity. And impurity is mortal sin, out and out. Speech, thought, action, mortal sin. And who's been trying to get you into mortal sin from the day that he came into existence for the devil? And you think that once he has taught you those lessons, that you will forget them? And you think that with the continual bombardment of television, and the continual bad example of your companions in school, your classmates, do you think that the continual bombardment that says it is very wrong to be different, and you should go along with everyone else, and you should not stand out and be singular, do you think that once you are in the state of mortal sin, that you will be likely to stand up for God and the ways of God? Not likely. So thinks the devil. And so after you he comes. And in the meantime, you are young enough and inexperienced enough to not see the danger until you are dead spiritually in mortal sin. Who does the teaching? The devil. He's a masterful teacher. He's so masterful, you are not even aware he's here. You are not even aware that he's speaking. You are not even aware the temptation is from him. All you know is, I want it. Want what? I want to escape this punishment. And so you lie, as though you were a practiced lawyer. You have a gift for speech. You can be so sincere. You fool even your father or your mother. They believe you. Why? Because they're not evil. And they love you. And they find it hard to believe that you would commit sin in speech just to avoid a punishment. But you weren't aware when you told the lie so well, as though you had practiced for a hundred years, you weren't aware while you told the lie that you were being taught and someone was teaching. No, he's invisible, but he's real. Did you ever see a cold? Is it purple? Has it got horns? Is it a circle? What is a cold? What is real, isn't it? Is the wind blue? Does it have a point? Has it many legs as it gallops along? You've never seen it, but you felt it. It's real. And how about a thought? Did you ever have one? Was it purple? Was it a square? Was it a triangle? You've never seen it, but it's real. There's a whole world all beneath us, all above us, all to the right of us, all in front of us and behind us. The invisible world of the supernatural and the preternatural. And the supernatural is God's world, and the preternatural is the devil's world. You've never seen God, but you will please God. And you've never seen the devil. Please God, you never will. But you know that God is real, and you know the devil is real. And God wants you. You are his prize. You are his trial. He made you. He put you in this world. He put you in this world so that you might learn to love him. And for that love, he would give you himself forever and forever and forever. And the devil who was supposed to have God in the first place refused. Oh, the devil, he doesn't want you. 
that he is the presence of God. What he couldn't have is equal to what you have. And this monster of cruelty okay, will give you a hell on earth if he can. It is the devil's business to teach you all about hell. How does he teach you? He puts hell inside of you on earth, hoping that you will die that way so that he may put people then in hell. Now that's his purpose. Because if he can put hell into your heart, despair, hatred, cruelty, obscenity, if he can put it all inside of you, blasphemy, disregard of God, and when you think of him, a hatred of him, if he can put that inside of you, and you die that way, you will be buried in the tomb of hell, very deep. He's cruel, kids. There are very few boys and girls in high school today that have the face of a boy or a girl in high school 20 years ago. Why? Hardly any of you have happiness in your face. Hardly any of you. You have worry. You have tension. You have misery. Some of you have pain. It's in your face. It's in your eyes. You've been robbed of your childhood. You've been robbed of innocence. So that by the time you were in the sixth grade, there wasn't much that you didn't know about the sins of this world. So that by the time you were a freshman in high school, you're old beyond your years. So who did it? The cruelest beast that was ever on the face of the earth, Satan, and his angels. God gave you good angels to God. Do you ever ask them for help? Do you ever plead with them to teach you? To teach continually. And we learn some of their lessons for a lifetime, but most of the time we don't learn them. Why? Because the lessons that the angels teach are the lessons from God, and you see they contradict our own selfishness, and they contradict the flesh, and they contradict the spirit of the world. I remember my temptations come from myself. They come from the world. They come from the devil who stimulates my flesh or stimulates my selfishness or stimulates within me the spirit of the world. And because it's me, I want it. I know what I want to do. I know where I want to go. I know who I want to go with. Because the devil stimulates me, spurs me that way. When the devil is contradicted by the good angel who teaches me what the angel teaches goes against what I want and I don't listen to that teacher or I do listen to the other teacher the teacher from hell now kids if you've got a brain in your head and remember I said you don't and I don't mean you as persons I just mean the kids your age no, you really are. You've been defrauded in school. The school has been a criminal laboratory. I don't mean a particular school. I mean the educational system. It has broken down the kids, broken down their morality, broken down their principles, their value, broken down their view of life, and broken down their understanding of the purpose of life. And then after it has split you, shattered you, after that analysis is done and you've been broken down, that the synthesis was put together again, only now none of the parts fit. Everything is out of place and nothing makes sense. You're the victims. You're not the heroes of this age, kids. You're the victims. The target, you, is bombarded with arrows from hell. And you don't even know the arrows are striking home. You don't know that you're losing your innocence and losing your modesty that you're losing the spirit of truth, that you're losing the capacity to do honest work without looking for a reward. Just because your mother asked you to do it or your father says, I expect you to have the more and not what I have. You've lost reverence. Think of it, reverence. You don't know how to behave toward God. I see kids come to Holy Communion in their arms are like this. I see some in their arms are like this. I see some in their hands in their pocket. 
and the slouch and the slump. I see some and they're talking like this coming up the aisle. I see some and they're whispering like this. They don't mean to do wrong. They don't even know they're doing wrong. They're ignorant. Who are they? The young people who have been so badly abused by this pagan world. They're going down. You aren't going to survive. You will be buried in hell. That's what's planned for you by demons and by men. Or you're going to be dead for it. And you're not going to be like the others. And you're going to be heroic because it will take heroism to be that different. But you're going to God because he wants that. You're going to let God have his way. What's the purpose of life to know God? Once you know him, you must love him. But once you love him, you want to do something for him. And what does he want you to do? Just one thing. Submit to his will. What's his will? To be a saint. Now, listen, get this straight. Some of the older ones are over here and some of the younger ones are over there. Before those kids go to high school, all of you are going to know a lot of boys and girls who have died. A lot of them are going to hell. Because right now they're not even in the state of sanctifying grace. Next year, they aren't going to be in it either. I taught many boys. Some of them are now dead. Are any of them in hell? I don't know. But they weren't that much older than you when they died. You think you're going to live to be 60 or 80? The insurance statistics are not in your favor. The insurance company makes money on being correct about how long people are going to live. Is an increasing rate of slaughter among the young. Slaughter. Automobile accidents, suicide, drugs. You're the victims. Now, either God is going to have his way or the devil is. Well, there's nothing in between, kids. Do you understand that? If God is going to have his way, you've got to be heroic. You've got to be different. You've got to go along with what your mother and father have taught you and told you and showed you. They're right. Everybody else is wrong. It contradicts them. And if you contradict them, you're wrong. Only it's not an error. It's a sin. God left commandments in this world, but he left one just for the young. Honor thy father and mother. He didn't say obey them. He said upon them. Depend upon them. Be like little chickens with a mother hen. Stay close to home. Stay close to your father and your mother's advice and example. And when they tell you, they are telling you from love. And if they should ever make a mistake, they made it out of love for you. For the minute you resist them, you are making a mistake, and it is more than a mistake, it is a sin, and you are not making that error, that sin, out of love for your parents. And there are consequences to sin. Sin is the most terrible consequence in the world. You ought to go to the insane asylum and see the boys younger than you and the girls younger than you that are in the insane asylum. You ought to go into the hospital wards and see the young come in from the emergency room, your age or younger, and see the condition that they're in. And all of this because of sin. Because of sin. Because of the cruelty of the devil. Because these kids voluntarily put themselves into the whirlpool. And a whirlpool just doesn't bring you around in a circle faster and faster. You go down. And you drown. You don't come up. Now that's what the devil has in mind. And he is trying to spin you into the outer circle. 
so that he can work you into the vortex of the middle, where you go with great rapidity round and down. And his best helpers in this world are your own pals. When your mother and father tell you that there are boys you're not to be with and girls you're not to be with, that there are those that you cannot go out with, you're to never date them, you're to never be seen with them, remember, they are the best teachers that the devil has. A boy or a girl who is very pure will finally cave in when enough of the companions in the school have mocked and laughed and jeered and sometimes even punched he or she until they begin to dress like the others, act like the others. And then you become one of the gang. But not really because they all destroy you. And children, they do that because they're learning cruelty to the invisible teacher. He is cruel. He will feed on you in hell. And you will never stop growing. You will never stop feeding. And he will roast you forever in hell. Jesus Christ has told us that. Our blessed Savior spoke of so much, but more than 40 times he spoke of hell's fire. There really is a place for those who have hated God, for those who have died in mortal sin rather than give in to God. Now the God above will forgive you anything but he can't forgive you if you won't let him. He will forgive you any frailty or any malice. He will forgive you the smallest sin or the most terrible sin. He will forgive you 50 years of sin. You don't want to confess him once. If only you will ask him just once. But he will not forgive you if you will not let him. If you die hating God, that's how it will be forever. And who will teach you to hate the devil? And who will he use? Your companions, even more than television, even more than movies, and even more than print, and even more than school, your companions. And who is going to protect you from print and from school and companions? Who is going to protect you from television and movies? And who is going to protect you from drugs and impurity? Nobody else thought. Your own mother and father. That is why they were given to you. That is why you were given to them. That's their obligation. They are in danger of losing their souls and going to hell. If through their fault, they consciously knew you were on the path to danger and they let you go, they sin. And if they die in that sin, they died having failed in their obligation to God to be your guardian and protect you and inspire us in heaven, Mother or Father. And you, if you die in your sin, having resisted a good Mother or Father's instruction and teaching, you have done more than disobey them, you have disobeyed God. And you must seek your forgiveness from God and as soon as possible. Lest, young as you are, you be called out of this world to judgment, and you be found spiritually dead on that day of judgment. Kids, be different. Don't be like everybody else. Don't use that argument at home. Don't say, but everybody's going. And don't cry and sneer in your bedroom when you're alone because you finally gave in but you won't forgive or forget because he or she would not let you go. There's only one reason why they don't let you go. They know better. 
that lived a long time and they know all about the dangers of children's lives and the children's souls. And remember what I told you, there were men who work 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and they work 365 days a year. There are men, and they haven't taken a vacation in 17 years, or 27 years, or 57 years. And they've worked 18 hours a day, and they have only one purpose, get the kids. We call them communists, or we call them Satanists. Or we call them modern humanists. They're the professors in the universities. They're the big shots in the movie world. They're the thinkers. And they have only one target view. And are they successful? Let's look what they do with the styles every single year. For a while they try to beautify the automobiles and then they make them ugly. For a while the architecture is interesting and then the architecture becomes grotesque. For a while men dress like men and then they get effeminate and start wearing the colors that only women wear and the fabrics that women wear. There are men in this city that remember coming home from Korea or coming home from World War II. Have anyone ever told them that they would wear pink or orange or yellow, that they would have silk or rayon on their body? They would laugh in the face. They would say, I don't know one man on the face of the earth who would dress like that. Do you think any man coming over from World War II or coming over from Korea ever believed that he would have a son or a grandson who would have hair down to his back with a ribbon on it, like a girl? And who would stupidly then say, because he learned it from his teachers and he learned it from TV and he learned it from the adults. Oh, our blessed Savior had long hair. No kids, the world is upside down and it's inside out. Men are getting soft and they're getting effeminate. And women are getting tough and they're getting shameless. And because men are losing manliness, they're getting vicious. And instead of fighting with their hands, they fight with weapons. And instead of living a natural life, they live on natural lives. And women just the same. And in women becoming tough and shameless, in thinking only of their appearance, they have a fear and a hatred of children. And they aren't going to let that happen to themselves, that they will bear children. And that is why you have so many unnatural mothers in this world. Unnatural because it's a monstrous act who kill their babies. That's the kind of world we live in. There were more babies killed last year. This is before the new law makes it possible to do it without any criminal punishment. There were more babies killed last year. Then there were American soldiers that died in Korea or died in World War II. Think of that now. Not that many men got killed in battle in World War II. And you see, those are the adult kids. See how strange their thinking is? Men are being destroyed and women are being destroyed. Men are becoming monsters and women are becoming monsters. And these are the adults all around you. And you're going to be just like them. You're not going to be different. Because you live in an age where everybody goes along. Don't be different. You've got to be different, kids. Because God wants it. How are you going to be? Well, God will give you the grace. God will give you the grace to be crucified with Jesus Christ if that's what's prepared for you. How do you think the saints went into the arenas and faced the lions and faced the sword and faced the fire 2,000 years ago? How do you think they did it? Because they were all supermen. No, they were just like you. They loved their mothers and their fathers. But if the mother was a pagan and the father was a pagan and the boy or the girl had become a Catholic, 
They went in and died while the mother and father sat up there in horror to think their son or daughter had gone so insane that they would die for Jesus Christ. If you have to die for Christ, God will give you the grace. Oh yeah, if you have to be pure for Christ, God will give you the grace. If you must be different from the others, God will give you the grace. And because it's so hard, it will take a lot of grace. And because it's so hard and God will give so much grace, you are lucky beyond other kiddos because that makes it possible to be a saint that much faster and in that much more sure manner. It was possible for young people to deceive themselves and think they could be mediocre. Year after year after year. But not anymore. You know it. You know that's a fact. You are going to be very, very immoral. Or you're going to be very holy. But no one's going to be in the middle. That's how fast things are changing now. And so kids, all you need now is one thing, to hold it in your mind. My life has a purpose. God gave it a purpose. Let me ask him what I am to do in my life. By praying, and by praying, and by praying. What do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? Now that my mother and father have made this clear, what do I do? Pray, and pray, and pray. God will strengthen you. God will give you the light to see, to know what to do. God will give you the courage to do it. He'll give you the generosity to want to do it. He'll give you the love of parents and love of God so that you will do it well. And when you die tomorrow afternoon or two months from now or 22 years from now or 80 years from now when you die, Jesus Christ will say, well done, good and faithful servant. And he'll say more than that. Because you will hear God say, come to me, you blessed. That's the whole purpose of life, kids. And if you listen to the spirit of the times, and if you listen to the educators, and if you read the books, and go to the movies, and watch the television, your mind will be so chock full with errors, you will be so confused, you will want to take your life, you will feel that you're going to go mad, you will run for drugs or for impurity to escape the horror of your present unhappiness. But if you love Jesus Christ, you will be the happiest person in the world. You will not be happy. You will be the happiest person in the world. You will have a peace and a contentment that no one can take from you, not even the devil. 